I would like to welcome um, Liat Aronson and Howard Draft for this first session of the last block. So please, let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to be back on the stage here, and even better to be on the stage here with uh, what has now become a dear friend um, and advisor to Horizon Labs and Horizon, Howard Draft. Although, as it says here, he is an advisor at Physical, he, that gives a small indication of That's only a small indication of his very illustrious and long career, which started when he founded his first uh, ad uh, agency in 1978. And he took that, and that was in Chicago. So we also have a little Chicago connection. He took that and proceeded to build it into a company with 8,000 employees, um, merged, sold, did all kinds of activity, but starting from direct mail all the way to full digital uh, media experience. And I think Draft Worldwide merged with what was then like a 133-year-old um, uh, ad company called Foot Cone Belding, very, very well known in the space. And I think that became like a, a mega company, which you retired from eight years ago and got really bored of retirement, I guess. Just couldn't do it, right? We're gonna to talk today about that transition from Web 2 to Web 3, and I think in the context of Howard's experience going from working with 100 top 500 companies and taking them through the digital revolution that happened with the internet and how it's going to lead from Web 2 to Web 3. So, can you kind of name drop some of those companies that you've worked with in the past? Uh, worked with the largest, 100 of the 500 largest brands in the world, from Verizon to HBO to Bank of America to Kraft, Mondelez, Yum, did all their advertising, you know. But I also had a healthcare agency. We had 19 of the 20th largest healthcare brands in the world from Novartis, Galaxo, you name it, we had them. Uh, Johnson & Johnson was a client of the company forever. Coors Beer, you know our work. You know us from KFC, Oreo cookies. So, major clients. <laughs> Another fun fact, um, you were a first investor in Facebook. In, 2000, in late 2005, 2006, they came to me to advise them because they had 60 employees at the time. They weren't sure how they were gonna monetize Facebook. So I placed the first 10 million in media in Facebook, cut the deal to become an investor there in 2006. Uh, we put two and a half million in when the valuation was 400 million. We put uh, the uh, first 10 million in media into Facebook. It took us three years to convince Zuckerberg to put the 10 million into the market. So the first media in Facebook was finally placed in 2009. So I, wanted to, I want to go a little deeper on that because I think that is something very telling about what's going on in the world today. So Facebook, when it was launched, and for certainly many, many years, wasn't clear what the business model would be, wasn't clear how they were ever gonna make money. Um, and in fact, it wasn't clear that they were essentially an advertising platform. And you helped them see that. Was it so clear to you from the beginning? When did you realize, and why did you invest in them in 2006? What did you see there? Uh, my 16-year-old son told me I'd be an idiot not to, so. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> note to selves, listen to you, what your children say. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, I think what was fascinating about Facebook to me was it was a new media platform. And uh, being an advertising person, you're always looking for new ways to target people. They had 7 million users at the time, all college kids. That's all they had. And uh, they were, you know, going from college to college to sign up universities so that they could, you know, get to advertise eventually on that platform. But to me, they had a very tight target audience uh, that could be expanded. But if anybody tells you they know what's going on Web3 right now, they're full of shit. And because they don't, uh, because I have learned that uh, this will evolve and change so many times over the next couple of years. You know, the, the laws of evolution in this space will be laws of revolution. Uh, my little company that we started right now 
I got back into advertising because I got really excited about Web3. And I got very excited about it. You know, I was the first, one of the first, I had one of the largest digital agencies in the world. And, uh, you know, one of them was RGA where we did design the Nike gym shoes where you make your own pair of gym shoes and stuff back 15 years ago. And it was revolutionary and was exciting. But today, the industry is still going to take three to five years to evolve. And I don't think it will really be fully blown out for 10 years. Uh, the most fascinating thing to me is when we started to build websites for people, the ability to get consumers to buy products you know, on a real-time basis based on keywords and then being able to design things were interesting. What I believe today in the Web3 world, it will be the most immersive, most engaging relationship that anybody has ever had with a brand. So what we're looking at these days is we're looking to try and help fashion brands or, you know, we got back into it because we wanted to get fashion brands to look at Web3. And I'll give you an example. Um, if you think about the world of fashion, and I, you know, pick a brand, Chanel, Hermes, LVMH, whoever you want to think of, uh, they have a fashion show every October. They're only able to invite 300 people to the fashion show. These are their best customers who want to travel to Paris and go to the show. Well, they have thousands of other customers who spend that kind of money in the rest of the world who aren't able to experience the show in a realistic, real-time way. So what I believe will happen in this world we live in, the woman will get up at 8 o'clock in the morning in New York. She'll know the show starts at 2 o'clock in Paris. She'll put on her goggles, which will have been given to her by the store because she's a high-quality customer. She'll start to experience the show. She'll walk into the show. She'll sit down next to Anna Winter in the show. She'll see all the famous people that she's engaged with. Her girlfriends will be at the show with her. She'll be able to look at the items going down the runway. The goggles will read what item she's most interested in and which one she's not. Then what will happen after the show, she'll be part of an experience where the designer will come on 20 minutes after the show, help explain to them what the items were all about. Then what she'll do is she'll go in and she'll see the salesperson at the store she operates with. So I believe both virtual and physical will still work together. And she'll sit there and there'll be a wall of her as an avatar. And the salesperson will be sitting next to her as an avatar and they'll go through the 60 items that were in the runway show and they'll discuss which ones look best on her and she'll show the woman as an avatar up on the screen in the various items. She'll then order those products that she wants, the ones she doesn't want. The company will make those products in her size so there won't be wasted. There'll be Most when you have a fashion show, it's 10 to 12 weeks before the clothes show up in the store. So the brands will be able to say, oh, that woman's a 38, so we're going to make this code in a 38. So all around the world in 200 stores, you'll be able to build a one-on-one -on -one relationship, which is what marketing's all about. The more you know about your consumer, the more you're engaged with the consumer, brands make more money. So I believe Web3, people will think it's all blockchain, consumers will stay at home and do all this. Really in the beginning, this whole process will be developed in such a way that the brand will work with their current distribution model, plus use new technologies to enhance and engage the consumer in new ways. So many brands will use gaming, they'll use virtual reality, they'll use augmented reality, but the experience is what every brand is after. Every brand wants to have an engaged experience with their customer. They want to have an experience that's all about emotional benefits. Brands don't sell on features. Why do you like Nike? You know, just do it. It's not selling a pair of gym shoes, it's creating an emotional experience with the brand. So those are things that I believe will happen from a branding standpoint in this space. Blockchain is a technology. Absolutely agree. Um, so if you think about what you just described, then this is definitely a transition. It's the web two to web three. It's enterprises using the underlying uh, technology, but in order to achieve that relationship with their customers, I'm probably thinking, well, you know, this is the question to you actually, in this, in this bridge time, business models will be based on their marketing budget. It won't be anything they're, highly complicated. They're going to take dollars from their marketing budget and they'll do some testing. The dollars will not be significant and it's going to take months and years. Okay. You know, and you know, you got to be in an advisory role. Let me finish this experience and how it all ends up back with you guys though. Woman buys her clothes. She's going to have an NFT embedded in her clothes. 
so the clothes will be sitting in her closet. A lot of these best customers have multiple homes all around the world. The woman can go to her iPad and know what clothes are in her closet. She can know what she wore because there'll be a calendaring app that goes into it so that the consumer can say, I wore those clothes when I went out with Liat two months ago, so I can't put the same items on. Clearly. And they'll have a weather application when they're traveling to Milan. They'll know the next seven days what the weather's like. So all it is is a more sophisticated database. You know, I come from the database world. To me, blockchain is a more sophisticated database. By using NFTs in the way of tokens to identify the hit purchase history, where the item was made, also resale values. You know, what is Armez worried about? People selling their bags, you know, in the secondary market and whether they're real or not. But if they're embedded with the right tokens, they'll know and the consumer will know whether it's the right product. So the business will evolve. The business will be exciting for all of you. However, it's all about a brand relationship at the end of the day. I think clearly with uh, that use case, it's absolutely true. It's, it's, you know, high luxury is not a very mass market kind of... Uh, um, but they have lots of money. No, it's a, it's a great idea. But I think um, if we go back to the Facebook analogy, I think one of the places where blockchain technology will be interesting beyond um, the, the NFTs and looking at beyond the business model of marketing dollars will be because it targets that younger generation through the gaming. These are um, a whole generation that is going to be much more receptive to in different incentivization that blockchain can allow. Well, they, so they understand play to win. You know, and if you understand play to win, tokenization in the gaming space makes perfect sense. And the problem is getting the major brands of the world. Let's go back. Who's going to leverage the world? Activision when they get merged with Microsoft. I mean, that's who's gonna be the biggest gaming company in the world. Therefore, what are they gonna do in the next five years to create an environment where you're gonna be able to have the ability for people to play in that space? But right now, you know, the money it costs to build a game these days in the time, amount of time is astronomical. Well, and then the m amount of marketing budget you need to actually make sure that people know you exist. And remember the old Harvard study. If you're number one in the category, you always stay number one in the category. If you're number two in the category, you can make money. If you're number three in the category, you might get to number two, but it's very unlikely, and you're going to have a tough time making money. And if you're number four in a category, please close yourself down, because <laughs> it's not going to happen for you. So brands, first, you know, Coke will never be passed by Pepsi. It's just not going to McDonald's is never going to be passed by Burger King. So number one in a category always stays number one in a category. Interesting. And, and that's interesting because even through this digital, digital revolution, that has stayed true. So while we can expect a lot of huge changes in things like business model, in kind of a relationship with our brands and kind of relationship with our data, I think that's also a big promise of blockchain. Um, you think the tried and true of, uh, of, of that adage stays, number one, number two. Well, yeah, that's absolutely. an interesting marketing uh, lesson today. Yeah, no, you, you're, you, never, you basically have to be a numkaput to go from number one to number two. It's, I, I know of no brand. Anybody know a brand that went from one to two? Blackberry. Which one? Blackberry. Oh, but that was, that's true, but... Adidas. Uh, Adidas was number one for a while before Michael Jordan. Now, Michael Jordan breaks the rules. Because when you have Air Jordan, nobody so, competes So there's Air a Jordan. rule, and then there's the exception to no, the but, rule. No, but the, but the evolution, you know. Yes. Adidas was a soccer company, a soccer shoe company. Nike, you know, revolutionized gym shoes. Right. Yeah, but uh, BlackBerry was a very high-level security phone system. Now, do you, you want to compare BlackBerry to an Apple iPod? Uh, phone, no, sorry, an Apple phone, would you say they're similar? I think it's a different product. I think it is, and I think that's actually where we're probably going to be seeing the changes. So the number one, number two exception, um, maybe we can build this thesis here, uh, comes when what the product that you're creating absolutely morphs into something else. Clearly right now we're not walking around with a phone. In fact, I don't even use my phone. We're walking around with a computer, right? It's a totally different product than it was when I had my first, uh, my first phone. We're out of time. This has been amazing. No, Thank it hasn't. And yeah. by the way, there's a rule. Never be the last person on a program in a day. 
No, we're not done. You, we're not done. There's pro- the, after us. You get the fact. smallest audience. <laughs> no, but actually, this is the, the last session, but we've still got a lot of content. We're going to go from here and talk more about Web 2 to Web 3, um, the, the evolution for enterprise in particular in both um, a spotlight that we have with Jesse and HL partner, and we're also going to be having a panel and talk about specific use cases. So we're not the last. I'm sorry. We're just the best. Uh, but you have to remember also, you need to be funny. Guaranteed laughs. Thank you both.